All right. You're going to get some background noise fading in here. We're just standing by here at Intrepid Museum for the astronauts to take the stage. There are a ton of people out here tonight, but uh, John Galloway with NSF here doing an Astro Live show, speaking on the standby screen. Have a bit of a show tonight talking about art in space. We've got Nicole Stott and Cy Dr. Cyan Proctor. They're going to be hanging out with Mike Massimino in the shuttle pavilion at Intrepid Museum. But uh, just a slight delay to getting started this evening. I'm waiting for them to walk onto the stage. Give me some 5 by 5s in chat. I think I'll just roll the intro and put the stream up, I guess, right? We have some 5 by 5s in chat over here. Lauren, thank you so much for the help. Just let me know that everything's working as anticipated. I'm going to go ahead and roll the NSF intro, and then we should be ready for them to walk onto the stage. They're not quite doing it yet. And here we go. We have lift off. Propulsion continues to be normal. Our CCA chamber pressure looks good. Following up. Okay, let's try that one more time. Welcome everyone to Astronomy Night. <laughs> there we go. 
<laughs> Excellent. My name is Alicia Siegel. I'm the producer of public programs here at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. We are so excited to be welcoming you all back here on site. What an amazing turnout, first of all. Thank you all for coming out, braving the rain outside and everything. Hopefully, you've had a chance to explore some of the amazing, cool things we have going on downstairs. Our education department has some great activities and demonstrations. We've also got some really cool table activities over here. With We've got um, an artist doing a VR experience. We've got the artist who uh, put together the holograms that are going to be going up on a CubeSat in space soon. Uh, and then, of course, later on, we've got our wonderful guest here, Dr. Cyan Proctor and Nicole Stott, who will be talking about their foundations and their experiences in space, too. So we've got all this going on all night long until about 9 o'clock. But before that, everyone, before we get to this presentation, did you know that this year is actually the 80th anniversary of the former USS Intrepid, the aircraft carrier that you are on right now. 80th birthday. How about it? Absolutely. So all year long, we're going to be doing all kinds of fun programming, just like this one. We've also got coming up um, more free Fridays. We've got movie nights coming up. You can check out some cool movies. We're going to be showing Top Gun later on uh, in May. We've also got our spectacular, of course, free series Astro Live that we do in partnership with NASA Space Flight on the Internet. So be sure to check that out every month. Plus, we've also got um, a number of other really cool behind the scenes programs online that you can tune in for, too, where we take you behind the scenes at some of the areas that are actually off limits to the public. So be sure to come back and check that out and uh, keep your eyes peeled for our public program schedule. But without further ado, I'm going to hand it on over here to our guests. Um, so I'd like to welcome to the stage here three amazing people um, who are going to be talking a bit about art in space tonight. So first of all, we've got our wonderful moderator, uh, Mr. Mike Massimino, former NASA astronaut and our senior advisor for space programs here at the museum. And then we are also pleased to welcome here tonight uh, former NASA astronaut Nicole Stott and also Dr. Cyan Proctor, who you might recognize from the Inspiration4 mission. She was the pilot for that. So um, another reminder too, Nicole will be doing a book signing after this presentation. So if you're interested in picking up a copy of her book, we have them for sale over here in our, uh, in our gift shop. And uh, she, her table will be right back there too. So I don't want to talk on anymore. I want to hand it on over to you guys. So thank you so much for being here again. Put your hands together for our guests. Well, th thank you very much for coming. Um, I, it's my pleasure to get a chance to chat with my two friends here, Nicole and, and Cyan. And I think what we're going to start with is we have some brief introductory videos, and then we'll have a conversation. And then after that, we'll open it up to questions. So why don't we roll? Let's see what we got for the first video here. Cool. That's, that's a real, I've actually read that book. Yeah. It's a good book. <laughs> From some extraordinary vantage points. From inner space on the Aquarius Undersea Habitat to outer space on the International Space Station. Witnessing the complexity of human survival in these extreme environments, I discovered three unifying and life-changing lessons. We live on a planet, an overwhelmingly beautiful, glowing, colorful, crystal clear planet. We are all Earthlings, and the only word that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets and protects us all. We build our spaceships as mechanical life support systems, like the ISS, to mimic as best we can what Earth does for us naturally. As a crew on the space station, we know that our survival depends on staying acutely aware of the health and well-being of our atmosphere, of our spaceship, and of all our crewmates. In contrast, here on Spaceship Earth, we pollute our atmosphere, our oceans, and our soils. We are experiencing devastating impacts to our planetary life support system and to all life we share our planet with. To survive and thrive, we must bring these three simple lessons of planet, Earthling, and thin blue line into our daily lives. I came back to Earth knowing that by behaving like crewmates, not passengers, we have the power to create a future for all life on Earth that's as beautiful as it looks from space. Yeah, nice. 
And that and that book, you have you have a bunch of copies here for people to you assign. I do, people? I do. That, okay, cool. Highly recommend it. It's a good book. <laughs> I actually read this book, uh, and it is a great book. And there is a little blurb from you in here. There's a blurb there for me in the book. From you in but here. the the other writing is much better than my blurb. It's a great book. All right, we have, uh, and then we have another uh, slide and video, I think, for uh, for Cyan. Yeah. Okay, here we go. The day of launch, I'm going to be thinking about how my entire life has led up to this moment. I was born on the island of Guam, and the reason why I was born there is that my dad worked for the NASA tracking station. And so I feel like space has always been a part of me. When I got that call, that Zoom, and Jared was on there, and he said that, you know, they picked me for the prosperity seat, that I was going to go to space with him uh, and be part of the inspiration for, it really was like um, getting the golden ticket for Willy Wonka. Everything in my life finally came into focus, and I realized that it was all about this moment in time. I won the prosperity seat for Inspiration4, and I did that not as a geoscientist or an explorer or an analog astronaut, which are all on my resume. I actually won this as a poet and an artist. We are striving for that Star Trek generation, that idea of a just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive space or a Jedi space. I'm gonna be the first black female pilot of a spacecraft ever. And to me, that just blows me away. And I want to encourage the next generation to dream that this is possible. And a Jedi space, that's what that's about. I'm Dr. Cyan Proctor, and I'm a mission pilot for Inspiration4. Thank you. And your book... You have a book, but it's not... There it is right there. I do have a book. So. I self-published it. You can get it on Amazon. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you. It's a book of art and poetry. Nice. Very nice. All right. So um, why don't we start off... Uh, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll go back and forth here, but we'll start with, with Nicole maybe and then Cyan. Same question, though. Um, you, know, you talked a little bit about, uh, in, your, in your video, sign, especially yours, about how you got to where you were. We talk a little bit about how you got to space. What was that journey like to get you there and how art was involved? Because that's, I think, a unique thing with both of you of how you know, your journey to space and how art helped get you there and was involved in getting you to a chance to fly. Well, I think, I think the journey was a long one. I think no matter who we are with, with respect to getting to space, it either feels like a long one <laughs> Or it really, really was a long one. Um, I, you know, I grew up, I'm really thankful to have parents who shared what they loved with me. My mom, very, she was a nurse, but a very creative woman still is. And if I got to an art class or a ballet class or to softball practice, it was because of my mom. And I'm very thankful for that, just kind of building up along with me as I was growing up. I loved artsy, craftsy things. I loved building things. And my dad liked to build and fly small airplanes, which um, I think was a very creative process as well. Um, certainly when you looked at our bikes and my mom's uh, washer and dryer that was in the garage where my dad was building things and painting them, we were speckled with all of those colors. So I maybe didn't even know that that was influencing me <laughs> somehow. But I grew up loving flying and wanting to know how things fly. And when I went to university, I studied how airplanes fly. And while I was there, I'm like, man, if you want to know how airplanes fly, why would you not want to know how rocket ships fly? Which then led me to working as an engineer at Kennedy Space Center, seeing what astronauts do. Very long path to realizing that, man, this astronaut thing might be possible, you know, to at least consider. Because up till that point, I don't know about you guys, but I thought, man, that's something other special people get to do. Why would they ever pick me? And very thankful to some folks that I consider to be mentors who did nothing more than encourage me to pick up the pen and fill out the application, which I think in the grand scheme of things is the only thing that we have control of <laughs> in the whole process is making that decision to put ourselves out there. Very thankful to them. And then jump ahead uh, you know, quite a few years to flying the first time. And when we get ready to fly in space, I think the same was true for you, Cyan. There's this opportunity to take up a little bit of like personal items. It might just be a little box of them or a bigger box. 
And um, remember our friend Mary Jane Anderson, um, flight crew equipment? She was the woman who helped us pack all of our stuff for space. And she was the one who reminded me. She's like, Nicole, you know, you're going to be living up there, not just working there. You're going to have free time. Think about bringing something you love doing down here on Earth with you to space. That turned out to be a watercolor kit. Very highlight, like personal highlight for me was the opportunity to paint in space, to share the experience of what that view out the window was like through what I would call a very um, elementary kind of painting. But it stuck stuck with me, and it's influenced everything I've done since then with uh, art and space. So just a a couple things there. Uh, You were selected in the class of... uh, 2000. 2000, and uh, and then you flew in 09. We, yeah. we were talking about that. It took yeah. a while. We had some things that slowed us down a little bit back then. But but, but you were up there for quite a while. You were first. You were an expedition crew member on space station, which is which you needed a hobby apparently, right? It was that <laughs> that's, uh, my my missions were kind of short, a couple weeks at a time. <laughs> But no, but uh, being able to yeah. do something like that is pretty pretty cool. It uh, is. It's really, although I think from the time humans have been flying in space, I have to think about it like it's putting the human in human space yeah. flight, right? Even those those really super short missions that were happening in the beginning, you know, we think about Alexei Leonov purposely brought up colored pencils with him and sketched orbital sunrises and sunsets. And then later on the Apollo-Soyuz mission, um, you know, that kind of historic, iconic mission where the Soviets and the U.S. came together, um, he sketched portraits of all the crewmates. And Tom Stafford still has that, like, over his fireplace at home. So there's been art and music and all of this with us in space since the very beginning. And I even discovered, I don't know if you know about this one, Dan Bursch, another... No. Uh, no, I would never expect. That. Another one of our astronaut yeah. colleagues weaved baskets in space. Dan Bursch wow. is a basket weaver, and and I asked him, I'm like, Dan, did you did you weave baskets in space? And he's like, Yeah. And I'm like, Well, why didn't we know about that? Why? He's like, Can you imagine if I had been like publicizing I'm weaving baskets in space? Like we send astronauts to be yeah. basket weavers basket in space, weaving. and they are the most beautiful, meticulously done baskets. They're extraordinary. But, you know, if you weren't a photographer before you get there, you become one. Our friend Karen Nyberg quilted in space. You know, there's poetry written, music played. It's just, it's been there jingle bells with a little bells and a harmonica back on a Gemini mission. You know, it's been there since the beginning. And I'm so happy to see, you know, our friends like Cyan taking that, like, very purposely taking that forward with us as we explore space. Awesome. All right, Cyan, how about you? Your, your journey to get there, again, it was a little bit in your video, but tell us more about that and how art played a huge role in that. Uh, yeah, you know, well, I was uh, chasing space my entire life because I, I was born on the island of Guam, and the reason why I was born there was my dad was working at the NASA tracking station during the Apollo missions, and, um, and so I grew up with all of this NASA memorabilia to my dad, and I thought, wow, you know, how great would it be to become a military fighter pilot and then a space shuttle? Because I grew up during that era, uh, a flight of space shuttle. And, uh, and then about 15, I got glasses. And because I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy in the 80s, you weren't going to be a military aviator. Um, but I thought uh, that was my only path to becoming an astronaut. Uh, and I didn't even think that I would ever be smart enough, I guess it was in my head, to be a, a mission specialist and do all of that. And, and so I gave up on that dream. And then in my late 30s, somebody said, NASA's looking for astronauts, you should apply. And so I applied for the 2009 astronaut selection process, and I got down to this yes-no phone call. And you think, oh, my goodness, I'm actually maybe going to make it. And then, unfortunately, it was a no. And I thought, okay. Um, well, how do I help advance human space flight if, I, if I'm not going to be a, a NASA astronaut? So I became what's called an analog astronaut living in moon and Mars simulations. And so I lived in a, a four-month Mars simulation investigating food strategies for long-duration space flight in Hawaii. And, I, and so I was doing those things. And then uh, COVID happened. And I'm, I'm a geoscientist by training, so I, a geology professor. And how many of you uh, took up a new uh, activity during COVID? Like, how many of you baked? 
Raise your hand if you became a sourdough expert during COVID. All right, how many of you picked up an, a musical instrument during COVID, right? Uh, it, ways of coping. And so for me, I picked up art and poetry during COVID as a way of, of dealing with the isolation and confinement. And literally nine months later, for me starting to do art and poetry, Inspiration4 was announced as the first all-civilian mission to orbit and that you could win your seat, a seat to space, by showing your entrepreneurial spirit. And so I thought, well, I just found my authentic voice as an artist and a poet. I am going to write a poem called Space to Inspire. And I read this poem as my video entry. And that won me my seat to space. And yeah. And then I got to say... Uh, uh, and it was really interesting because you show up at SpaceX and you're like, okay, I'm an artist and a poet. I want to paint in space. And SpaceX was like, you're not painting in space, you know, with the SpaceX Dragon. I said, no, there's precedence to this. And I pointed out that Nicole, I sent them Nicole and all of her stuff. She paved the way for me to be able to paint in space because I, she was the uh, example that I was able to show to SpaceX that we could do it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I can read. Do you want to hear the poem? <laughs> I'd like to hear the poem. All right. Is it's called Space to Inspire. All right. I feel like I have to stand up. All right. Um, you've got space. I've got space. We all have space to inspire. That's why we dream of going higher and higher. But what is space if you can't breathe? Let's stop sucking out the air of our humanity. We have a moment to seize the light, earth from space, both day and night. We have J for justice, to ignite the bold. We have E for equity, to cut past the old. We have D for diversity, to end the fight. We have I for inclusion, to try to make it right. A Jedi space to rally behind, a universal force so big it binds. Inspiration to change the world. A new beginning for us to hold. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about space to inspire for all of humanity. Science, technology, engineering, and math sending us out on the explorer's path. But don't forget the arts, the heartbeat of time. Consider sending a poet who knows how to rhyme. So let us drop the mic and close the capsule door, but please make sure Dr. Proctor's on board. My space to inspire is what we need, inspiration for, for all of humanity. So that was the winner. That, was, the, that, was my, that, poem, right. that won me a seat to space. That's a pretty good poem. All right, so if now let, let's that, that's your your path. We talked a little bit about things you did. What, some top memories, Nicole, in, in the art. In, do we, we see some pictures? I don't know if you've known some of the things you painted. Uh, what are some of the memories of your flight? You had two flights. One was a, a long duration flight. Um, you went up up and back on the shuttle, right? And then and then a shuttle flight toward the end. That's it. Was the second, third to last flight of the shuttle program. Did you, were you guys second to last? You guys are third to last. Third to last. Third to last yeah. flight. So I, if you can just share with us some of those, those memories and also some of this, you see that, that thing actually, that was it, you had that in a cupola? I did, thing, but we set it up after. You did? Yeah. And that's not the same thing that's back there? No, it's a different, different one that's I would hope there, so yeah. because that would make it very rare, the one you had back there. <laughs> but tell us a little bit about some of the things you did in space and some of those memories and how art was related to what, you're, what you did up there. Well, I think, I mean, I think art was related all along. Um, you know, there was the, the painting in space on the first mission, which certainly was, I mean, for me, really was a, a personal highlight of, of the flight. I think it has allowed me to, to share the experience in a unique way after flying in space. Whether anybody, I was talking to Ross earlier, like whether anybody likes my artwork or not, I think it's a really neat platform for, because I believe art's like a universal communicator. You can engage with pretty much anyone, even if they don't like your art, right? Um, but it's just a wonderful way to get people, and there are people, I know all of you 
are not these people. But there are people who don't even know there is an International Space Station, right? <laughs> kind of kind of makes the stomach churn. But art, I think, is a way for us to share that experience or share these special experiences. So um, I really, really appreciated that. Um, I think before, like, that second flight on the STS-133 mission, which was the, it was the final flight of Discovery... And when we were first assigned to that flight, it was meant to be the final flight of the space, station, space shuttle program. And I've got, I've got the patch here um, uh, for the STS-133 mission. And I think it's, I mean, you guys might argue about space flight patches, but I think it's one of the most beautiful patches ever created. And the way Art connected with that was we thought, okay, we're the final flight of the shuttle. We want to make a really special patch. We want it to be kind of simple to represent you know the the history the legacy of the space shuttle and we reached out to a really amazing artist named Robert McCall who if if there's probably somewhere in this museum there's likely a Robert McCall painting He's got the big mural at the Air and Space Museum right? and there's ginormous his? murals yeah. at Air and Space um, he did some of the very earliest I think he did the STS-1 patch he did Star Trek art he did space you know 2001 a space odyssey artwork a really incredible artist and we reached out to him to do our patch and he did he did it and um i think it it represents beautifully his style but also i think it really represents the space shuttle program very well um and then highlights for me besides art in space um i don't know just be in there with a really cool crew is I think everything we do comes down to the people you spend your time there with. Getting to float with people like that, fly in front of a you know a window and look out at the the planet. Um, I don't know. Spacewalk's not bad. It's kind of at the top of the list too. Flying the robotic arm, all the science, pretty awesome. Did you now the the paintings we've seen here that are popping up? Did, did you know what you wanted to paint before you got there? Did, did you get inspired by something you saw that said, I really want to paint this? How did that work? Yeah, I had no plan other than I had the paint kit, which um, when some of you go back, go up to the space station, you know, if we ever get back up there, I, I, would, I have people on a mission searching for that paint kit that I left up there. Um, but anyway, no, I had no plan. And I just kind of over time, looking through the window, was um, looking for that place that I wanted to paint. And one night, it sh- or I guess it was a day pass on Earth, it popped up. And it was this tiny little chain of islands on the northern coast of Venezuela called Los Rocas. And to me, I just remember looking at it and thinking, oh, my gosh, it looks like somebody reached down with a big paintbrush and painted a wave on the ocean. And I'm like, okay, that's it. <laughs> and it had all my favorite colors of Earth, you know, all the turquoises and blues and it was just stunning, and so yeah. And as you can imagine, you can't float in front of the window and paint what you're seeing out the window, because yeah. at five miles a second, it's going to be gone before yeah. you can get the brush to the paper, as yeah. you know. And so I printed it out on a little scrap sheet of paper, and then would just work on it at night outside of my crew compartment. Yeah. Sam, how about you in, in space? You said you they did event. They let you paint. Did you you painted in space? How'd you get inspired? What 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 are some of the things that stand out to you? Uh, yeah, you know, um, we had the cupola, but uh, like Nicole was saying, you just you're moving so fast and going into day and night to draw and paint a, an entire thing. Uh, it just takes too much long too long. But I had, before I went to space, I actually had an idea of what I wanted to paint in space. And, and so I have my, my character Afro Gaia, or Mother Earth as I refer to her. And, and so I wanted to have her in it along with, you know, colors that represented the beauty of our planet, followed by uh, the SpaceX Dragon capsule also up there. And so I actually did two pieces. And uh, so one of them was a dragon for our dragon capsule leaving the Earth. And actually, I don't have a picture up here. Um, this picture I took because I'm an astronomy fan, and that was me living in the, the Mars simulation for four months. Um, but let me see if I can bring this up real quick here so you can see my painting in space. So this is, this is what I painted in space right here. And uh, and that, that I, I feel very really, very fortunate because we were only in space for three days, and but my crew members it takes hours to do that, and they gave me the space to be able to 
um, take. And then I also drew my dragon. So that was a dragon that I drew while I was in space. And, uh, and, but we also had, like, my crew member Chris Sombrowski brought a ukulele, and he played that while up in the cupola. So, again, music being a big part of, of the experience. But also, um, Nicole, we worked with Nicole and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. One of our goals uh, as an inspiration for a mission was to raise $200 million for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital to try to end childhood cancer. My crew member, Haley Arsenault, is a childhood cancer survivor. And so she flew with me and has a prosthesis in her leg. And, uh, and so we, Nicole helped make, like you saw the, the space suits, she helped make beautiful jackets for each me and my three other crew members with art that the kids of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital crew, uh, made and had it all stitched together in these jackets that we brought to space and we wore them and then we auctioned them off for Saint, to raise money for St. Jude. And so, you know what was one of the coolest things about those jackets, though, was that each of you had your space for art, too. And each crew member did their own original artwork on the jackets, too. It was so, so awesome. So there's uh, these special one-of-one jackets that are out there in the world um, that flew to space with us. But, again, we had this connection with St. Jude and and art and art therapy. And I know Nicole does a lot of that with her foundation and this whole idea of, of having kids be able to express themselves uh, creatively, particularly when they're going through really tough times in their life. And, and so being, having St. Jude and art as part of our mission was so important. Okay, so I've got one more basic question and then we'll go out to the crowd here. But... With all these experiences that you've had in space and artwork, what's what are you doing now and and looking forward? What what combining all these things, the the art and the space and everything else? What's happening now? I know we got we know about the books. What else you got going? You got a cool project. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, I think if I you know um, if I could do nothing else, it would be working with the kids with the Space for Art Foundation and our. Um, mission statement is that we're uniting a planetary community of children through the awe and wonder of space exploration and the healing power of art. So space-themed art therapy, if um, in the simplest way, I guess. And uh, we started in one hospital in Houston, and now we've branched out to kids all over the world, hospitals, refugee centers, orphanages. And I'll tell you, I really feel like I discovered my next mission in life. From the very first session with these kids, it was like, oh, my gosh, I got to go to space so I could come back to Earth and do this work with these kids. It's just been like, I don't know, like like life like started again with respect to all of that. And um, really feel very fortunate to just be able to continue that work and branch it out more and more to more kids around the world. And it's like science said, you know, these kids... They are. They're going through what you hope is the worst thing they ever have to go through in their life. And somehow, I mean, space is really inspirational. And the opportunity to have a creative outlet to go along with that. I mean, these kids are thinking about their future. It's a, tr- very, it's a transcendent experience for them in a place that you hope they never have to visit again. Yeah. And, and the spacesuit that you have on display here and that... A yeah. different one flew in space. Yeah. What's the story behind all that? So what we started with at first was with art spacesuits. And um, the very first one, like I said, was just kids from MD Anderson in Houston. And then um, the suit that you saw in the pictures here and that was some of the videos um, at the back, that's a suit called Unity that was built with kids in hospitals in all of our International Space Station partner countries. And that one, we had the opportunity to fly it to space. It was so much fun. Peggy Whitson flew it, wore it, and flew it through the space station. We did a, a video conference from Mission Control with kids that we could bring to the hospital and then hosp- the uh, Mission Controls around the world and then piped it into the hospitals and stuff. Um, and then we just kind of progressed from there. Um, the suit that you see here tonight is called Beyond. It was built during the plague, you know, those two years. Um, we collected all of the artwork Uh, It's meant to be the ambassador for Spaceship Earth, really telling the story of this connection between personal health and planetary health and how we all need to behave like crewmates and not passengers. And uh, we have artwork from at least one child in every country on the planet on that suit. And 
hopeful to be able to tour, tour it around to some of those places that participated. And while we can never promise to um, send anything to space, we're always very hopeful and are looking for any opportunity that might open up to be able to do that. And the suit's with us today. There is a suit, a suit with us, us today, today so beyond. Make sure you yes. check that out. Okay. Cyan, what do you got going? What's your, what's your current projects and uh, yeah, happening? Well, I've got uh, two really big things that I've been working on. One is that being a new artist... Uh, started in, during 2020. I have an artist in residence with Arizona State University. So I'm helping, I'm developing my craft. And so I have some of uh, my art, my new art on my table back there. But then I also started a foundation and it's my first year of it. It's called the Proctor Foundation for Art and Science. I have been a community college professor for over 20 years. And so the community college is system is really near and dear to my heart and often gets overlooked for a lot of things. And so I started a foundation where I'm sending uh, BIPOC, black, indigenous, people of color to space camp who are community college students, but they're art and humanities students and not your typical science students. And so we have our first cohort of, of BIPOC community college students going to space camp this summer. And it'll be fun to see how their art and humanities creativity can be, uh, can, it can ignite some creativity in the space industry. Okay, why don't we see what, what's on the minds of our friends out here. All right, if anyone has any questions, yeah. Go ahead and raise your hand and we can come around. Any questions? Oh, got them. Okay. Let's head on over here. This is always the fun part where I try to sneak in between people. Okay, oh sorry. <laughs> Have anybody uh, meditated in space and how does it differ from meditating on Earth? I'm still figuring out how to meditate on Earth, so I'm not, I've been doing that very poorly, you know, with my mantras and stuff. So, <laughs> you know, I, I I did not meditate in space, but I when I came back to Earth, I was trying to find um, find the closest thing to what it felt like to be floating in front of the window and experiencing Earth like as our planetary home. All of this, you know, the interconnectivity of all, all these things you hear about looking at Earth from space, and. And because I remember being in space, and if during the day, if I went to the window during the day, I had to set the alarm on my watch. Because I, it was a really, it was a, 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 like to remind me to go back to work. Because it was just like this transcendent, you just got sucked into the view out the window. And so I wanted to find something like that coming back to Earth. And meditation has been the closest thing that I could find. I'm very thankful to have had like this teacher over the interweb during the, the plague even helped me um, figure that out. And, um, and if you can do that in one of those float tanks <laughs> where and really get to where the lid is closed and the water is the same temperature as your body, I mean, that's the closest I can come to what it felt like to move in space. And then I would highly encourage something called earthing, which uh, you probably already know if you're asking a meditation question, but which I just discovered when I was looking for a yoga mat. <laughs> so, you know, searching a yoga mat and came across earthing, which I do every day now. I wake up in the morning and I purposefully barefoot, go outside, stand in the grass and just chill for a little bit and just think about the fact that my feet are on a planet. And there is, there is a grounding kind of effect that goes on between the charge in your body and the charge of the planet and... I, I don't. I think if you pay attention close enough, you can maybe get a sense of that. But just that, that experience of acknowledging I live on a, I'm on a planet, and then looking up at the sky that seems to go on forever, and but acknowledging the reality that it is like this veil thin blanket around us. Uh, I get goosebumps thinking about it every day. That's what I do now. And um, I mean, I'd encourage you all to do it. It's really incredible. It, it's absolutely a ground. It, it is a grounding meditative thing. It, I, I mean, it makes you realize your connection to everything. And, and that right now we're sitting on a planet that's spinning at a thousand miles an hour. <laughs> and yet we just feel like we're where we're supposed to be because we are. And, um, and then it all kind of makes sense and it, makes you love the people around you and appreciate all the awe and wonder that surrounds us every day. It's pretty extraordinary. 
Did you? Oh, I, I don't – no, I, didn't, I really enjoyed the view out the window. I don't know if it – meditation, but it was certainly uh, listening to music and looking at the view. I, I think what it did is it, uh, it made me appreciate how beautiful our planet is. Earth is a beautiful place. I think it uh, was meant to be seen from orbit when, I, when you see it in its full beauty. But what that did is it, it helped me appreciate what we have around us. So I live here in New York City, and I, it's, just, it's a beautiful place. I love going through Central Park. Cherry blossoms are changing colors these past couple of weeks. And uh, so uh, I think it has made me appreciate just the beauty around us, the, even the weather. I know it might be raining out, outside now. Um, but even the buildings that we have here in the city and the views that we have, there's a, there's a beauty to it. And all the people, even riding the subway, just the, the, just the full experience we have of being here. Um, I, I think that my experience in space has helped me appreciate that more. So, All right, we have another question over here. Thank you so much for being here. I think you answered a part of my question, but I'm wondering how has your perspective of life changed after coming back from space? Well, I mean, I, I think I, I spoke to a little bit of it in the, the whole meditation earthing thing, but I, I, I don't think there's any You know, and these are things we know before we ever go to space. Um, you know, kind of the simple lessons of, of, for me, I try to sum it up like, because I am, I do think about things simply, but, you know, oh my gosh, we live on a planet. <laughs> that, you know, we're all earthlings, only border that matters, that thin blue line of atmosphere. And I, that's my mantra, like every day now is planet, earthling, thin blue line. And The, the sense of interconnectivity of absolutely everything, like, oh my God, there is no other side of the planet. It's this one beautiful thing. Um, the opportunity to float in space and look at it. I think about it like, you know, watching storms on Earth. Like, so cool to see like a thunderstorm and the lightning strikes and how it was like, that was, that was the wake up call for me. Like, Man, I grew up in Florida, and when I saw, you know, you experience thunderstorms, and it's like, oh, when it's gone, it's gone. You know, that was over me, it's gone, it's gone. But it is not. It's like this, like neurons firing in a brain and just wrapping around the earth and looking alive or watching a hurricane, you know, move across the ocean and how beautiful it looks from space. And like you're watching it with the mute button on it. It's the weirdest thing. And you're seeing this fluffy, white, gorgeous thing. And then in your brain, you're like, man, I know my friends in Florida are not appreciating this the same way I am right now, right? Just the contrast in that that gets you thinking about things a little bit differently. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot to it. But I don't think you have to go to space to, to understand all of that either. The, the, the Earth is a planet thing, though. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So on my first flight, uh, I, was, uh, I got a chance to spacewalk a couple times. And it was one other rookie on the flight. I was a, you know, a rookie astronaut. My, one of my classmates, Dwayne Carey, Digger, was the pilot. He's an Air Force pilot. And he wasn't going to get a chance to spacewalk because he was busy flying a spaceship and all that. So he said to me, he goes, and we, we were very good friends. And he goes, Mass, look, he goes, I want to know, that was my, my nickname is Mass. So he says, Mass, I'm not going to get a chance to spacewalk. I'm a pilot. I'm not going to get a chance to go outside. So I want you to tell me what it's like. And I, and I want to know what, it, I want a full report. You know, these other veteran guys, they, they say stuff. And, you know, we, you know, it's good. But I want to hear it from you. I want to hear, I can't go, so you're going to go out there. I want you to come back and tell me what it's like. So I go, you got it. So we go out, we do the spacewalk, and I look around. It's extraordinary. And I come in, and I'm on the, hanging on the airlock. So you get back in the airlock, and, and you're hanging off of there. And then you need help getting your, your helmet and all that off. So Digger is right in my face. So he's like this, you know, and he gets in the air. He's the first guy. I mean, he didn't even know how to take the helmet off. He's just, you know, he's, a, he's in there, like, waiting, trying to help he wants to. But he's there because he wants to hear my reaction. He doesn't want it to get, you know, polluted by anything else that might happen, like me eating a sandwich. He wants to get before he even get a, So the helmet comes off, and he's right there in my face. He goes, what was it like out there? And I go, Digger, you won't believe it. And he goes, what's that? I said, the earth is a planet. And that's, that's the thing I said to him. He goes, what? And, he's, and he looks at me like, you know, what was going on inside of that spacewalk, inside of your space here? And I go, it's a planet, man. It's not what we think it is. 
And I went on to tell him, you know, we think the earth was this place where it's like two-dimensional and we, yeah. we're safe and we go places and we drive here. We come to the museum, you go to work or whatever. But it's not that at all because I could look and I could see the earth and then I could look and see the stars and the sun in a black sky and maybe the moon and every once in a while a satellite. And really, we're right out there traveling around in all of this chaos that's there. The earth is a planet. So when, when you said that, I was like... That's exactly the what I reported to Digger. It's the same exact thing. Yep. All right, you, want, you can go on to another question. Okay, in the first row here. here. How do you do art in space? You know, uh, for me, I was really lucky again because Nicole had led the way, and the but what the key is that you don't want things to float. Uh, away now. This is a difference. Uh, I guess I've never asked Nicole this. Is that when I went to space? Now you can buy yeah. paint brushes that you can preload with water, and then so they come with the ability to ma- have water in them, and you can squeeze them, and the water will come out to the bristles, and surface tension will hold that water to the bristles, and then you go and you swirl it into your watercolor, and again surface tension will hold it there, and then you can go to your canvas and paint it on. So I was like, wow, this isn't as bad as I thought. But every for every action, there's an equal and opposite act reaction. So you're trying to brace yourself in a in the spacecraft, and as you paint, you get pushed back, and so you're kind of bobbing and weaving because you you can float. And so ha- trying to be able to control yourself. And so SpaceX helped me create a painting kit that had Velcro so I could Velcro everything and, and stick it to stuff so it wouldn't float away. But I did lose one of the caps to my watercolor pen, and it floated away, and I thought, oh, no, what's going to happen? But luckily it floated all the way over to Haley, and Haley got it and gave it back to me. And so it wasn't too bad flo- uh, actually painting in space. Yeah, I think so. I didn't have the water pens or the water um, brushes, but um, I wish, you know, I only have one picture of painting in space. I think it pops up here every now and then, but which I thank my crewmate Bob Thirsk for just floating by and taking a picture. I wish I would have videotaped the whole thing because I think um, by painting in space, you're squirting out a ball. You know, you don't have a cup of water to dip your brush in. You're squirting out this ball of water. It's floating. You're kind of dipping your brush into this floating ball of water there's the that before the brush even touches the ball of water because of that surface tension and the way it behaves it's like the water wanted to move onto the end of the brush it was the coolest thing and then watching that with the the paint and the paper and if i actually touched the brush to the paper the whole blob of colored water went in you know into the paper so i kind of got to the point where i had to drag the ball of water the colored ball of water along the paper so it, to me, when I think about it now, it reminded me of just how everything that we do, the way our bodies float, the way the fluids in our bodies float up, you know, shift up to our heads, the way we move, the way you got to keep track of your stuff, the whole way you have to change how you live and work in this new environment, I think you could have represented it through painting with watercolors. And um, what I realized is it wasn't more difficult it was just different, and you had to take into account all of these kind of subtleties of what floating in space means to be able to do something that you love in a whole new way. Very cool. Great question. All right, right behind him over here. <laughs> okay, how do you guys, like, what do you guys eat in space? And I have one more question. How do satellites work? So, how do satellites work, and when do you guys eat in space? I'll take the eat in space. They can take the satellites. People who are going to be talking about cube satellites that you could talk to back there about that. But yeah, what do, what do you eat in space? That's a good question. Well, we had pizza, cold pizza, which was delicious, yeah. and I had the best BLT of my life up in space. So we actually ate really good. Uh, we had M and M's, Skittles, um, granola bars, uh, but the pizza and the BLT were. Definitely two of my favorites. I think on on shuttle and station, we have a lot of food that's um, packaged, like ready to eat. You know, the military rations or um, stuff that you have, they've sucked all the water out of and you have to add water into it to eat. But it all, I mean, I don't know 
about you, Mike, but I thought it all tasted really good. And on the space station, we had even a, a, a more of a variety than we do on the shuttle because we had the International Space Station partners. And so we had food from all of the different countries. And, man, it just really tasted good. There was a nice variety of food, I thought. And there's nothing like floating around a dinner table either. That I mean, it's really cool to, to eat in space. Yeah, I, I really like the food as well. I think I'm one of only two people that gained weight in space. I'm sorry, did you? But Mike crew, Barrett gained weight. In he, space. he did. He did. How many times? Because I did it twice. I Mark Lee only did it once, but I did it twice. And we didn't have pizza. No. Now, if, you know, what did you guys like, stop made off it at the deli? With, or uh, <laughs> yeah, you kind of like made it, but well, tia, but you had hot pizza. food. You know, we, yeah. we there was no cooling or um, freezing element in the Dragon capsule. It's designed to go to the International Space Station, but we were doing a free flyer mission, so we just orbited and lived in the Dragon capsule for three days. And so SpaceX made a cooler um, out of foam and stuff, and then they for ice they just froze our our iced tea, our tea, and our coffee. So we had frozen coffee in the morning, and that kept uh, pizza and BLTs nice and uh, delicious and cold. Very clever. I actually ordered a pizza from space. Yeah. On landing day, before we before we closed the computer, I put my order in at Abatino's. Remember that place? Down yeah, there? and that was... It doesn't exist anymore. But down at the Cape, that's right. Because I didn't trust anybody. I thought they would screw it up. I said, no, <laughs> I'm doing this directly. That's what I got, too. They were like, yeah. what, what, what did you miss while you were in space? And you, the food is really good, but there's not a lot of mix of textures, right? You don't get, no. you know, yeah, and I'm like, like man, I want a slice of New York-style pizza. Right. The crunchy crust and the sauce and the melted cheese. Yeah. And I don't drink a lot of soda, but I wanted no. a Coca-Cola, real Coke. Full blown, no diet stuff. Crushed <laughs> ice, that Sonic crushy, chewy ice, um, in a styrofoam cup with a slice of pizza. It's amazing what you miss, right? And they they give it to you. They yeah, you can yeah. You you pretty much when you get back, you get whatever yeah, you want yeah. until good. they forget about you. Yeah, a week until later. like a couple hours. Because there's another crew going yeah. to space after you. You're done. Uh, but the other question we had was about satellites. Yeah. So uh, how they work. It all depends on what the satellite does. Almost anything can be a satellite. The, spa- the space station yeah. is a satellite. It orbits around our planet. The Hubble Space Telescope where I went is a satellite. It also orbits around our planet. So they and they work. I mean, there's a lot of things you can we can go with, but like they're they're powered typically from like the the Hubble and the space station and many other satellites from solar power because they're out in the sun. And there's a lot of there's a lot of energy from the sun. So typically, they're solar powered. Sometimes they're powered with other through other sources and they transmit information usually to the ground things we're interested in a lot of them are for communications for us to use the internet and that's growing more and more as we have more needs to do that more things are getting launched and they stay in or they get launched they go very very quickly at, in order to, to stay in orbit they go very very fast and eventually orbits do decay and that sometimes can cause a problem with if they re-enter and so on but there's there's a lot to it. That's a pretty you know that question is a lot of different ways we can go with it. But uh, we're, there's a lot of them out there. You can see them in space. Did you see them when you're out there? You can see them like I did, a, yeah. out in the distance. One of my spacewalks to see this thing going. You can also see them if you if you're interested. Uh, there's a there's an app to follow the space station, and yep. there's one for Hubble too, and probably other things too. You can look up at certain times in the at certain times during the day, usually right before. Or right, right before or after sunset, or right, yeah, right yeah, around re- when the sun, yeah, just after sunset, or right before sunrise, you can you can look and see these things in the sky. So that's pretty cool to see them fly overhead. And it's really, I mean, I I think it's really neat when you start thinking, like, just even acknowledging that there are satellites is a really cool thing to do. You know, you meant like communication, and you know, how do we get to po- from point A to point B? I remember talking to somebody recently about that. Because we were talking about like all of the things, and I would argue that everything we do in space ultimately is about improving life on Earth, right? All those satellites up there helping us measure the vital signs of the planet to solve the problems that we have. But I was talking to somebody recently about the value of space and what it brings back to Earth. And I finally said, you know, well, how do you know, you must use GPS, how you get from point A to point B now. And they said to me, I don't need GPS, I have my phone. (laughs) <laughs> and I was so we had to have the little conversation but it's incredible how satellites and all of what we're doing in space are just embedded just every day in our daily lives and add in value yeah crazy 
All right, we have a question against the wall over here. Thank you. First, thank you guys for your work as art advocates, the importance of art, and that's how I kind of see a, a lot of your efforts. My question comes in, oftentimes people don't see the value of art. If you look at our school systems, when there's limited resources, the first thing that goes is art programs for children. And so I'd love to hear your experiences on the front line of advocating for art, where at NASA there were scarce resources, at SpaceX there's scarce resources, you have a limited shuttle. What was some of the pushback you got that said, oh, art isn't as important as X, Y, or Z, and how did you respond to that? So we can take that as an example when we're dealing with other programs here on Earth and saying, hey, no, space thought art was important. We should hear important now. I think, uh, you know, for me, the first uh, pushback was when I brought it up to SpaceX, and, it, 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 you know, first they were like, I think that they, they're, in their head there was like, there's going to be paint everywhere in the Dragon capsule, that this is going to be out of control. And, and for me, it, was, it became a non-issue as soon as I showed them what Nicole had done. And, um, and then SpaceX immediately turned and said, okay, we can figure, because they're, they're really great about uh, solving problems. And so they were like, okay, uh, you can do it, but we're going to make sure you've got all the things that you need. And so that's when, you know, the Velcro, and they, they, they created this beautiful case for me to paint with. And on my, uh, my YouTube channel, you can actually see me painting in space. So I've got video of that. Sure. And <laughs> the, adv- the advantage of going 12 years later. Um, and, but the, they made this case where my paper and my, all of my art supplies and everything was Velcroed in and stuff. So they really gave me the ability to access that and do it. But what I loved about my crew members is they were very supportive. They were like, absolutely, you're going to paint in space because, you know, this is the second day going into the third day and we all have stuff to do and we got to pack up the capsule. And they're like, you know, Cyan, just go get in the corner and, and make your painting. And so it was really great to have that support from um, not only SpaceX to make it happen and uh, believe that I could do it, but also my crew members. You know, and I... I I'm so thankful that they, they, the light switch went off and that that happened. And for me, I had no, there was no pushback at all from, you know, wanting to fly. Um, I'm very thankful, like I said, to Mary Jane Anderson for, like, even encouraging me to think about what that thing would be. And then it was just a matter of, okay, Nicole, you got to bring your paints in so we can make sure they're not toxic and they, you know, that they won't pollute the air or whatever or make a big mess. Um, very supportive. And I think that's gone on all along within NASA. I mean, when I think about artistic, creative things, you know, Mike, I always think about you. Remember the series of, um, like, little video stories you were doing for the Public Affairs Office, I think. And it was, like, sharing all of, like, the way training went. You came out on the, the pool deck when we were doing spacewalk training, and we're all talking. But it was in a really fun, creative, engaging way. Not something that NASA was typically known for doing. And I think it was really a spark that got a lot more of the creative communication about what we do in space going. So thank you. Well, no, thank, thank you for you that. For that. And it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, art, I guess, can take It's so many forms. forms. It yeah. can be storytelling. It can be yep. artwork. It could be filmmaking. Yep. Um, so yeah. thank you. I mean, Writing. It, it, Writing, really, course. really good. Yeah. And then I just have to comment on, because I could talk all night about it, but I won't. You know, I'm a rambler already. But the comment you made about art being the first thing that goes, it's why I struggle with the whole STEM thing, right? I don't want there to be any acronyms. I want my son using his whole brain. So I think by NASA and SpaceX and other kind of at-the-cutting-edge tech agencies proactively, actively incorporating art and storytelling and all kinds of creativity into the process, it will help encourage um, the schools to do so as well. Yeah. All right. And then our last question, we actually have from the internet. So So real quick, uh, we've got folks watching online and they were talking about astronauts normally don't have a lot of free time in space. You don't get to go up there and just sort of lounge around. Basket well, weave? You don't get to go up there and basket, basket weave? Basket weave, nice. Zero-G <laughs> basket weaving. Um, but with the rise of commercial space travel, how do you think the role of astronauts will change as maybe they get more free time? Like, what may astronauts spend their time doing in space if it's not all experiment, experience, science, science, work, work, work? For everybody up there. 
Well, I, so I'm just going to say, I think as we look more, not just to the commercial side of, you know, in, increasing the number of people that can have access to space, and that includes more scientists actually being, the scientists actually being able to travel to space to do their work. Um, I think we're very shortly going to have to start thinking about um, when we leave Earth even further, you know, and not just the moon, but as we do start to travel to Mars, because I, that's going to be in our future, and there's people in this room probably that are going to be the ones doing that, and maybe they'll call us and invite us to go with them. But, you know, everywhere we've traveled in space so far, we've had this stunning view of our planet out the window, whether it's 250 miles or 250,000 miles. And now you're going to go to Mars, and that, I think, at the closest is like 35 million miles away. And so very shortly into that trip, you're going to lose sight of Earth as Earth. And you're not going to be in the Hollywood spaceship, right? You're going to be in a relatively small spaceship that they're, already, they're like having to put the bathroom into the bulkhead of, of the spacecraft. And so I think this whole idea of art and creativity and the human is going to be even more important. And I'm looking forward to the Star Trek holodeck, quite honestly, to be part of what solves that problem. Yeah, I, uh, I totally agree. I think that, you know, um, like you were saying, I think the big thing is being able to observe what's happening around you and, and experiencing that and uh, being able to reflect back on that. And so as we go from low, um, low, low Earth orbit to the moon, Mars, and beyond, um, and there's fluctuations in what you're doing as an astronaut um, time-wise, uh, having the ability to look out the window um, and, and have this amazing view and, and create these perspectives that you can share through art and poetry and music and all of those things. Um, I think that's so important. So I, I, when we're talking about your son using his whole brain, you know, we want astronauts. And we want people to be well-rounded and be able to express the things that are happening as humanity goes onward into this new frontier. And so I'm excited. I'm excited about what's going to happen. Um, there's a picture that's going to come up in a minute here, I think, of me in the cupola. And you can see the light on my face, and that's, that's Earth light, the light of our planet that's reflecting back. Think about moonlight and the way moonlight makes you feel when you walk outside. And then you imagine right here, that is all Earth light, not sunlight, our beautiful planet. But like you were saying, there's going to be a time when we get so far away that you won't be able to be bathed in Earth light the way I was there. But I look forward to the day when the first astronauts get close enough to Mars and they look out the window and they get bathed in Mars light. And how will that make them feel? Will it have an emotional attachment to them that we don't understand yet? And, and so I'm excited for our future and the way that we're going to be able to capture those moments if we're thoughtful and send astronauts who are all that also embrace the arts and in unique expressive ways their own creativity okay well uh i think that's i think that's <laughs> yeah. it yeah that's <laughs> it so right. thank you thank yeah. you let's give a round of applause for everyone our guests. put your hands together again mike massimino nicole stott dr siam proctor so amazing to hear all of your experiences and just the the impact you know that your foundations too are having it's so wonderful so again you know thank you for being here and for uh, enlightening us with some art and space topic so everyone uh, this is the end of our panel for now but they are not going anywhere as you may have noticed we've got some tables over in the back there uh, Nicole Stott's going to be doing a book signing of her book back there you can talk to her more about her experiences uh, Dr. Proctor is also going to be there at her table she's got some cool art uh, that you can create off of her own art, actually some coloring pages and talking a bit more about how her foundation. We've got um, an artist, Ashley Zielinski, who has a VR experience that you can go through that's based on the James Webb Space Telescope. And also uh, C. Bangs, who is the artist who put together some holograms for a CubeSat that's going to be sent into space uh hopefully in the next year or so. So uh, don't go anywhere. We're going to be here uh, through 9 o'clock. And I hope you all are having a wonderful time at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. And again, shout out to all of our uh, fans and friends who are out on the internet watching us here tonight, too. All right. So have a great night, everyone. Have a great astronomy night. And we'll see you back here sometime soon.
All right. I should be here really quickly. Let's see if we're getting uh, audio from me. It looks like we are. Good deal. Oh, hi. And Alicia. Hello. Too. Hi. How's it going? Hi. Do I need a microphone? <laughs> uh, do we have another? Here's another lab for you right oh, there. Is it on? That one, didn't it? Yeah, that one should be on. Yeah. Hi. So, anyways, <laughs> we're actually here we at Intrepid. Here. We weren't just uh, streaming this. Yeah. I feel like I just saw you here a couple months ago. Well, you know, we're, we're out here every chance we get. But uh, this is Astronomy Night. Yes. It's actually a free night at the museum, it right? Is. This is the first of our free Fridays here at the museum for the summer. So we'll be doing this through September. So come on. It's usually uh, the last Friday of the month, but, you know, check like the schedule. every month? Every month. Okay. Every month um, until September. Through the weather and everything, you know. Uh, but we've also got... Um, Movie nights that are going to be coming up as well. We're going to be doing um, in May Top Gun from the flight deck. Come on out for that. The new Top Gun? The old Top Gun? Actually, both. We're both. going to do the old one because it's a cult classic. That. We always have people who come out every year and camp out to see it. It's an aircraft carrier. I mean, come on, you got to. And then we're actually going to have Top Gun Maverick, the new one, at the end in uh, August, I guess. In August, or, nice. or September, whatever. So, um, yeah, but astronomy nights, you know, always fun, always a blast here. We've got so many cool things. I mentioned earlier, we've got our education department doing activities and demonstrations downstairs. Downstairs and behind, there's cables behind thing. us and all sorts this of is, stuff. This is new for us, this actually. Is our We're having a lot more. <laughs> That's not exciting. <laughs> we have a, a lot more engagement here tonight, which is cool. We have, again, our, our panelists, uh, Cyan Proctor and Nicole Stott, who are actually engaging with the public now, doing a book signing and doing some art activities. We've got um, an artist who made a VR experience based on the James Webb Space Telescope and worked with the whole team with that to have like a virtual space that they could engage in and, and talk in during the pandemic. And then um, the CubeSat exhibit over there, they're using holograms on light sails, and, like doing all this experimental technology. There's stuff going on. This is why we need Alicia here. I could have never I told you all, all the stuff talk. that's going on. I'm like, I know there's stuff going on at Astronomy there's Night, but I can't on. mention it's what true. it all is. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, it's it's been great. And the turnout was great today. And thank you all for tuning in here as well. We yeah. love you. Uh, and uh, yeah, it really is, like it really is cool. Like we say this every time we stream the shows, so you can sort of participate, even though you can't make it here. If you ever make it to New York City, like you ever have any opportunity to come here, the Intrepid Museum is a place that you really want to see. There's so much to do in the city, but you have to spend like at least half a day. I don't know. Is there at like the some? Intrepid? Yeah, oh, the Intrepid. Huge, yeah. Yeah, yeah. At least, yeah. So come over here and check out things. They always have special events like this, like the astronomy night things that are going on. And of on. course, Astro Live every Astro month, Live, which yes. you all already know about. That's a thing. It's, Sort of this month, Astro Live is astronomy. That's where it came from originally, right? It, it was is. Astronomy Live. It and it came oh, yes. And I should mention, too, for those of you tuning in at home, next month, our topic for Astro Live is going to be crew capsule recovery. Oh. So there is a little bit of a tie-in with Intrepid. Uh, this is the 80th anniversary of the ship, the commissioning of the ship, uh, 1943. Of course, it's a World War II air aircraft carrier, yada, yada. But uh, also, we picked up spacecraft during the Mercury and Gemini eras. So we're going like to be... There's a mock-up hanging off the side. There is. There's, there's like a there's hidden a exhibit things, yeah. at the museum, and if you know where to go on, on the hangar deck, there's like a little door with a little window and a little plaque next to it, and you, you can, can look out the secret too. window and you can see the... It's the know. Gemini capsule yeah. being recovered. Uh, so Very yeah, cool. so we're going to be talking um, with... I. I it's not 100% confirmed yet, but we're going to be we'll looking. Them, we're going to be looking into um, how recovery will be for Artemis 2 and then also how uh, SpaceX crew capsule stuff is. Maybe can, you know the diver. You know, can no, we you get the, the diver? They don't the backflip. Would you like <laughs> engineers and whatever engineers? They'll talk about the diver, no, but we, we just don't want the diver to do a backflip. Like just get cool. them here. To, just, like they could do a backflip off the side of the off museum. The intrepid. <laughs> like like Nick Cage and National Treasure just jump off the side of the Intrepid. <laughs> Wait, what is could that a thing? Possibly go wrong. Yeah. That really happened. Yep. Have you I never knew, seen No, I knew Will Trevor? Smith hit a golf balls in I Am off Legend. Of, off of the, the A12, which was not yeah, yeah. real. That was, like, was, yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was forced. Person. But it was like a thing. But no, he, but he off really the, jumped off the side. That's what I've been told. I, don't know. I feel like I might break a few bones if I did that, but... <laughs> Anyways, yeah. that's our that's our thing here tonight. Um, we're going to go ahead and shut the stream down. As always, we know we were competing with the Falcon Heavy yeah. that is scheduled to launch at uh, 826 right now it is. Ah. So if you're missing out on that stream, likely you had it up in two windows. But Falcon <laughs> Heavy, last I saw, I'd have to come over here and see oh, if there's been an update. I don't know. I don't know if it's still on or not. But last I heard, it was for uh, 826 this evening. They pushed it back towards the end of the window. But uh, uh, competing with Falcon Heavy, tough, tough act to to compete against. But thank you all so much for hanging archived, out. So they it can is. come back and watch it whenever. Yeah, you can watch the shows whenever. <laughs> whenever. But thank you all okay. as always for hanging out wherever you're hanging out at or wherever you're watching from. Um, you're on the Intrepid social media channels. Mm -hmm. You're on Facebook. You're on their YouTube. Like click like and subscribe there or whatever they do on Facebook these days. Ring the bells. Um, ring the, the bells. You're on the Twitch streams. 
times, you know how to get yeah. back to a Twitch stream if you want. And if you're on the NSF YouTube channel, well, clearly, you, you must be a super fan because you're watching this show instead of the Falcon Heavy show. So you're awesome. I wish and I had free you. merch to hand out, yeah. but I don't. So, thank you. Anyways. Um, that's going to be the end of the show here from Intrepid for now. And I'm sure everybody will mosey over to see if Falcon Heaven makes it. Falcon Heaven? Ooh. Falcon Heavy makes it through the weather tonight. I think it was, like, shaping up. Uh. It was rough yesterday. Yeah. Did you see the lightning? Yeah, it hit. Yeah, Yikes. I did. I saw that. Yeah. Yikes, you bet concur. Anyways, <laughs> uh, we're going to go ahead and shut down the show. All right. <laughs> you can just do them all yourself. Yeah, I can. Good. I great. just did. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to shut down this stream. We'll leave you in the capable hands of all the other things that are going on. As always, <laughs> thanks for watching. Again, from the Intrepid Museum, this was Astro Live, a special Astro Live on a Friday night here mm -hmm. as part of the astronomy night that's happening. But uh, I'm John Gallo. And I'm Alicia Siegel. And we will see you nerds later. Now I just have to like awkwardly come over here and click the uh, <laughs> thing at the right time. There, see? And then I'm just going to like go. There. <laughs>